Hello, BookTube, and welcome to Book to Film. This week it is Harry Harrison's Make Room, Make Room that was published in 1966, and that was made into a film by Richard Fleischer in 1973, starring. Uh, Starring uh, Charlton Heston, uh, Edward G. Robinson, uh, Lee Taylor Young, uh, Joseph Cotton's on it, Will Bissell, a lot of older actors as well uh, in the twilights of their career. This was the 101st uh, film for uh, Edward G. Robinson, a fabulous actor, and I'll be talking more about that. Now, uh, I think uh, I'll read... A uh, little section here, um, which sort of tells you everything about this, well, m a lot about this book. Monday, August 9th, 1999, New York City. Stolen from the trusting Indians by the wily Dutch, taken from the law-abiding Dutch by the warlike British, then wrestled and turned from the peaceful British by the revolutionary colonists, uh, colonials, its trees were burned decades ago, its hills leveled and the fresh ponds drained and filled, while the crystal springs have been imprisoned underground and spill their pure waters directly into the sewers. Reaching out urbanizing tentacles from its island home, the city has become a megal megalopolis, with four of its five boroughs blanketing half of one island, over a hundred miles long, engulfing another island, and sprawling up the Hudson River onto the mainland of North America. The fifth and original borough is Manhattan, a slab of primordial granite and megamorphic, metamorphic rock, bounded on all sides by water, squatting like a steel and stone spider in the midst of its web of bridges, tunnels, tubes, cables, and ferries. Unable to expand outward, Manhattan has uh, writhed upward, freeing on, feeding on its own flesh as it tears down old buildings and replaces them with new, rising higher and still higher, yet never high enough, for there seems to be no limit to the people crowding there. They press in from the outside and raise their families and their children and their children's children raise families until the city is populated as no other city has ever been in the history of the world. On this hot day in August, in the year 1999, there are, give or take a few thousand, 35 million people in the city of New York. So... It's set in 1999. It starts out in August. And there are 35 million people living in New York City. Wow. Um, so, and that's where sort of it starts from. It's a bit of a detective story. Uh, there's a police officer uh, named Andrew Roosh. Uh, he lives in a very, very small apartment uh, with another... Uh, person uh, named Saul Solomon, and they share their. They've divided the room like it was by sounds of it originally a bigger room, and it's been uh, uh, with a partition. So he has a bit of a uh, bedroom uh, separate for himself. And as I say, the, the streets are teeming, and uh, there are rich, uh, and they live in nice. Nice plush apartments uh, with lots of electricity, lots of water uh, and air conditioning because there's global warming in this world. And uh, the summer August is extremely hot. They're in the middle of a heat wave. And they the, everything's rationed. There's hardly enough food for people. There's no jobs for most. Uh, so they are on a welfare type state and they are given handouts by the state of food. They have to queue uh, or get in line for water. And uh, that's ration and there's there's always upsets regarding that. Food, as I say, uh, is in a uh, very small supply. And they've been uh, using uh, plankton. Uh, for food, and uh, a big part of it is something called Soylent Green, which is a plankton. 
not of plant plankton food made made either into uh uh, they, they, uh, fake beef or steaks or what's uh, most popular are crackers of some sort. So uh, Andrew Roche is is uh, assigned to a murder uh, in a in a Chelsea apartment building. A young um, well, it, it, it's got to do with this young uh, person as well, a young uh, Chinese descendant uh, in his late teens, impoverished. Uh, he was part of a mob that uh, broke into some shops and he got a lot of uh, these Soylent steaks. He sold them and got a few uh, dollars for them. And he wants to sort of, you know, better his life or he that that that's his idea so there's uh he he goes to work for a telegraph uh a telegram uh company and his first assignment is sent to this rich tower so he he realizes and he sees that the uh the uh surveillance system is not working and uh, while he's, you know, after he, he delivers the telegram and there's no answer, he goes to the basement and he finds a window that is uh, open and it's, uh, well, it's the lock is broken. So he marks it to come back later. So he comes back eventually at night time and uh, he gets in and he uh, breaks his way into the apartment hoping that it's empty. Uh, the bodyguard is gone, and the uh, woman named Cheryl is gone. Uh, but he he starts rummaging around, and the owner uh, comes out of the uh, after taking a shower, and uh, the young lad has a crowbar uh, that he brains the person. He he puts it in his head, kills him, and then he flees. So this is where Andrew Roosh uh, sort of comes in and he's investigating. And uh, at that point, uh, the, compa the the dead person's companion comes back, uh, which is Cheryl and the bodyguard after shopping. And it turns out uh, the dead person is a sort of raconteur, a um, um, sort of part of the mob and uh is somewhat retired but has you know a string of prostitutes and other other things and that's why he's 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 very rich and he lives there so he realizes that you know it's a failed burglary burglary because there's no um there's no uh, uh nothing missing no nothing stolen and uh he yeah, and and then um, like he goes back, and makes his report, and he figures that's going to be it, and and uh, you know it's going to be unsolved because there's not enough manpower. There's so many murders every day in the city, and there's going there there's a lot of uh, unrest with the people because of the numbers of people and the lack of food and water at times. But there's pressure put on from above because there's hints that this uh, ex or current mob boss uh, had connections with uh, some, you know, judges and so forth. So it's come down that to, to investigate more. So he does. He takes he takes his time and he investigates more and he goes back to the apartment and the uh, oh, uh the dead owner's sister comes and wants to take everything away and he says no we can't it's an investigation and uh the woman there is the sort of com companion uh paid companion uh of of this mike big mike um that, that, that has died and she doesn't like her she calls her uh the sister calls her a whore and everything and uh but uh uh, because she she's young and she uh, the way the way the situation is in that society she has latched herself on to him uh, as as it seems to be in the society a lot of young women do that are beautiful and young and they get taken care of uh, but she seems to um, 
be a little cut above that, or at least Roosh uh, sees it as well, and he, he he stays there, and they start having an affair, and eating uh, the food that's left, and enjoying the luxuries of this, of this uh, apartment because he gets some meat. Uh, he's never really had meat before, uh, booze, a um, lot of beer. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, running water, he can take a shower, which he rarely ever to be able to take a shower or a bath because there's never enough water to do that. Uh, so, uh, and it becomes like a whole month that, you know, up until the end of the month that he, he investigates and then the sister comes to take over, uh, the, uh, the, the belongings and everything. So, so Cheryl has to leave, but they've become very attached to each other. So she doesn't want to try to find somebody else. Uh, so she moves in with, uh, Andy Roche, uh, and Solomon. It's, it's many steps down for what she had, but she grew up in similar circumstances. So, and they've fallen in love by this time. So he, he continues to search for this uh, this lad, uh, and eventually he finds him um, because he goes back home. He's been on the lam and he's been living out in on a on a uh, deserted ship in some other uh, land that's been fenced off. Uh, but he gets kicked out of there by local uh, local toughs. Um, and he goes back home, and uh, Roosh uh, catches him. But he shoots him, and he dies, uh, and so it just it just continues on. If uh, things are getting worse in the city, uh, there's problems with the water supply. Uh, they they drain the um, um, I think underground wells a little too much, and then salt water has come in. So then now they have to tr basically truck in water. Uh, from outside the city, so it's it's severely rationed, and it's getting winter time, and it's it's very very cold. Uh, it, it's extremely cold winter they have, uh, and there is a, there, there there's vehicles, but mostly people get around either well they walk within the city, uh, and there's trains that go out, but uh, they're very expensive, and uh, it, there are taxis like pedal pedal cabs I think they call them. Uh, where they get around with somebody, um, like you, you go in the back and the person uh, walks or runs. Um, with, uh, I know a little uh, with a seat. Uh, the, 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 the passenger sits on a seat and the, the other person runs and carries the person along. So it, it, it sort of continues on then. And uh, because of the population issues, uh, the government is thinking of, of enforcing or allowing... Uh, birth control, and that is a huge part in in the story. They believe that uh, you know it shouldn't be, and there's even a report that's uh, tagged on in a prologue in uh, December 1959. President of the United States Dwight D. Eisenhower said, "The government will not, as long as I am here, have a positive political doctrine in its program that has to do with the problem of birth control. It is not our business." And I'm assuming, I, I haven't looked that up, but I'm assuming I think that's a real, real thing. But it causes controversy, and uh, the Solomon believes that it should be. He, he's quite knowledgeable, he reads, uh, and um, he's up on all the political news of the time, because they do have a TV and so forth. Uh, and and the electricity mostly is generated by him pedaling on a bike, uh, charging charging batteries uh, and they have a fridge and so forth as well but they live very meagerly very very small and um, the, the relationship between the two Andy and uh, Saul is uh, a very good friends uh, Andy was living in barracks uh, at, at the police station and um, Saul was looking for a roommate uh, to a certain extent so uh, they they started living together in that way as as roommates and sharing um, and they became very close as friends. So Saul, Saul believes in this uh, birth control. So he goes out to demonstrate for it, but he gets trampled and he gets a, his hip is broken. So he's brought back. He's kicked out of the hospital because they don't have space. People are lined up uh, on the streets uh, the, outside the hospital. This it's, it's so bad. 
uh, and like the bodies are taken away by waste disposal. You know, there's just so many. Um, and uh, but Saul can't get out of bed, he can't move, and because it's a bad winter, he develops pneumonia and dies. And so he's taken away, and the room is sort of empty, and they figure, well, they've got a little more space, but then all of a sudden, the old uh, um, um, bodyguard that was for this big mic um, comes in, and, uh, oh, just before that, I'll just say, yeah, like the connections, all this connections with government and stuff like that aren't proven, so the case is finally closed, more or less, uh, regarding his death, but anyway, um, and then, then this big, uh, the, the, the bodyguard has been hired. Like he's, he's trying to get work anywhere and he's, he's an honest guy, but he, he just, he needs to work. He needs, he's got a family to feed. So, uh, he's hired to go along and they place, the government places people in rooms or places where there's space. So there's this family that he's gone along with to make sure it's okay. Uh, and they're being placed in the room that Saul was. Uh, living in and we're talking like you know like five kids uh, in a very small room and they don't want to do that Andy and Cheryl they don't want this they because they figured they can get another policeman from the barracks uh, to come in it would be better if they have to do this but nope that's not the case this family moves in uh, and uh, they're just noisy uh, and like the children don't go outside to the bathroom they just go uh, they, 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 uh, use the corner of the room for a toilet and it stinks and the noise and he's getting really tired of this and she, she's freaking out and she says something must be done. Uh, and then it sort of, the, 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 the novel sort of trails off at the end where she leaves and, um, he's, he's just, you know, continuing on his beat. He's, he's a police officer. He just continues, uh, working. And, uh, uh, you know, he eventually does see her with some, you know, posh or more richer people, but he doesn't say anything. And that's basically where it ends. Uh, and, and the book, it's just a, a very, in some ways, a very real um, view of what would happen um, with that many people, uh, because... Uh, they're saying that, you know, that the United States at the time was using so much, uh, uh, you know, the Earth's resources. And then if it got to this kind of thing, they would need more than 100% of the resources, just the United States itself. So, uh, which obviously wouldn't be that good. You probably hear fireworks in the background here now because it's getting late. It's, uh, well, not too late. It's, um, what time is it? It is coming to 10 o'clock um, um, so but they're already starting early with it anyway uh, yeah it's 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 I think it's it's a very real uh, depiction it's a bit slow in some ways but it's 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 well written uh, it's I, I enjoyed it I, I like I remember reading this uh, um, and yeah it's it, it's a fun it's a fun story. Um, it's a dystopian, and this was the book that I had chosen for the last week of uh, New Worlds November. So I'm a bit late, <laughs> like four weeks late, if not more. Uh, but in 1973, a film was made called Soylent Green uh, with uh, Charlton Heston. Uh, Edward uh, G. Robinson played Saul. A uh, beautiful role, uh, his last role, and uh, they they made many changes. They set the the uh, the the film in twenty twenty two, so it's very apt that this is my um, Saturday the first of January twenty twenty two book to film, and also too it marks the sort of beginning of the uh, future history project as well. So it all doves dovetails together. Uh, but yeah, so they changed this. Saul is no longer retired. He works for the police as well, and he's called a book. Uh, he does research because there's no, uh, in that world, there's there, there's no sort of computers in, in the sense like, like they would have for all this information. So people have to actually look and research for this. So they have dedicated officers to do this. 
and he he's one of these and the room that they share is is similar uh but he's got his section all full of books uh reference books and again um the story uh well and, and also too they made they've changed it from 35 bill, uh, million to 40 million um the new york city for, for the film uh, and it's just, yeah, just teeming, teeming with people. Uh, but there's, there's a murder as well as, as Joseph Cotton, but he's not a gangster. He's a uh, well-placed, uh, he was a judge uh, or a lawyer, I should say a lawyer, uh, a retired lawyer. And it's like the, instead of uh, a young Chinese boy that goes in and it's, and it's a, uh, uh, failed burglary this is a hit uh the 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 guy is hired to do this and he goes in purposely to kill him but to make it look like pretend it to look like a burglary but uh um thorn now uh the character that uh, uh that is roush in the book is called thorn is investigating um the dead person um is is uh the old actor uh, uh joseph cotton uh, a fabulous old uh, classic uh, film actor and he goes there and he sees the the you know the luxury that's being lived in this place with the uh, um, uh, you know uh, uh, with the rich and he just sort of collects he takes everything that he can it's like it's it's just a given that the police everybody's corrupt and there was there is one really good line in the film is like you know once you draw a salary his boss says you know you are bought <laughs> you know you take a salary you're bought um and so he you know he take he takes uh the food like a piece of uh meat a uh, big, large piece of meat, um, fresh fruit, vegetables, soap, uh, and two large uh, reference books on the Soylent Corporation uh, that that creates the uh, food or the, the uh, what's now world's uh, most of the food for the world. So he's investigating this, and um, uh, he he goes back um, to the apartment again, and Cheryl the. Uh, woman the companion there is having a party with all the other girls in the apartment and they change this too uh that she sort of belongs to the apartment she's hired by the apartment she she belongs to the apartment as the other girl do and in that society they, she's called furniture she's part of the furniture because she goes with the apartment she's basically um a sex companion to whoever if they want her uh the next tenant and so forth uh, and, uh, he goes back and he takes it for granted, you know, what she is. So he goes immediately, uh, wants to talk to her and, and he just goes, you know, get in bed basically. And she just does and knows, uh, what's happening, but they do form, uh, a bit of a connection, but it's, it's just, a, it, it's just like, it's clear in the society that w what her place is and what his place is. And what she does and what she has to do to survive. Uh, and uh, and then he gets back. He starts reporting on this. That he's making some headway. But his boss is saying, you know, um, you know, close the case. There's pressure to close the case. Rather in the book where there's pressure to keep it open. This is to close it. Uh, because there's connections. But Saul, uh, the book... He he is doing an investigation and he finds out something horrifying. And he goes to the exchange and there's a neat little sign while he's walking in through the case is authorized uh, you know, personnel or something like that, books only. Which is kinda neat because he's going into a library, but his he's called a book because he's the person who does this. So I thought that was a neat little thing. But anyway, he goes in and um uh, and they, you know, he's done his research because these great big books on the Soylent Corporation uh, sort of are numbered and limited edition and don't officially exist. So there's information in there and he learns from them. Um, and like I say, a, a bad secret that the, the foods, uh, the world's food supply and plank plankton, the oceans are dying. And so what they do is they they are creating food from dead people 
uh, and that's what's called the Soylent Green, the Soylent Green of the film, uh, of, of the title. And um, so he he goes and, you know, um, goes to a euthanasia uh, 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 building where you can go to end your life. And uh, so... Um, Thorn, the cop, he, he like he finds out he he just he just knows there's something going on and he wants to stop him. But and then while he's you know doing his um, uh, while Saul is dying and watching all this uh, imagery of what the Earth used to be like, green, plenty of water, animals everywhere, uh, and listening to music. Um, Thorn is listening to him on earphones and he's telling him, you know, uh, get proof for this because they, they don't have proof about the solid green. So Saul dies, uh, Thorn follows the body through into, and the bodies are taken into it's just a continuous stream and, um, garbage trucks are backed up and they're just filled up garbage trucks and they're driven out of the city to a waste disposal plant where the bodies are turned into crackers green crackers to feed the people so he gets sort of caught uh, spying there and the uh, governor uh, where the connections are that that actually uh, uh, you know had the hit out for the uh, the retired uh, rich uh, lawyer uh, because he he had a, uh, a case of conscience and he he was a liability to the business and to everything so he had to be eliminated so now uh thorn has to be eliminated and the goons are sent after him and he's chased uh into a church where the uh, where, where the uh um where the retired uh, uh lawyer had gone and confessed his sins to the to the priest who is sort of almost gone insane by, you know, gone mad by this fact that he learns of what Soylent Green is. Uh, he gets knocked off as well because they think he's told Thorn. Um, so there's the, the bodyguard is the bad guy in this one. And the bodyguard is shoots uh, Thorn several times. Um, but Thorn uh, perseveres. And at the end, he gets the sort of the cavalry comes in he, because he's able to call uh, his precinct and his his lieutenant comes with reinforcements, but and they take him away and he tells them tells them that he must get this information to the exchange that he's got proof for this and people must be told and it's a great ending where uh, Charlton Heston's character Thorn is taken away on a stretcher and he's got a bloody hand and he's screaming and his hand is held up like this in the center of the screen and there's blood on his hand. And the black of the screen sort of comes in to a narrow slot of just his hand, bloody hand in the air. And that's where it ends. And then it goes into, um, you know, more, more sort of um, those pictures that Saul was watching a, a video of uh, like films of green, green earth and things like that. Uh, it's it, it, it's obviously vastly vastly changed from the film. It's made much much more dramatic by the soil and green aspect and the and the cannibalism and the feeding of the people and and the more corruption in the society. Uh, it's more pointed. It's uh, uh, and, and the beginning of the film starts with a montage, which is kind of interesting. It's it's weird. I'd forgotten that this montage was there unless. When I saw it, it might not have been there, but I, I just don't remember it anyway. I'm sure it was there. Uh, and it's showing, like, you know, Victoria, like 19th century pictures of America, you know, wide spaces, a few people here and there. And then it gets up more recent, and then all of a sudden the, the picture's like a very fast montage and so many people, like crowds and, you know, garbage and all this kind of stuff. And it's just showing the, the, the current society. Uh, and, and it's well filmed in many ways because there's a, uh, I was wondering how they did this, uh, because I really noticed it on, on the, uh, Blu-ray rather than m remember noticing it before. Uh, there's sort of like a, a green sort of, well, it's like smog and that's the idea of smog sort of moving over, 
over uh, everything. Uh, like you're looking through this green smog uh, when it's outside. And uh, the in the commentary, Richard Fleischer uh, does commentary, and so does Lee Taylor Young, who plays... Uh, uh, Cheryl does the commentary and a few good things of it. Uh, he explains how they did it. They actually filmed, I guess, through water with some green dye so so they could see the swirling of it. Uh, and it makes it look good. And it's got, yeah, say the greenish aspect, aspect of, of smog, but also obviously soil and green um, for the title. Um and yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I think it's a good film. It's, it's like, it's changed the, the sort of, I, I think the book is more showing that this is the way it is and it's, and it's not going to change. It's just getting, going to get worse and people are adapting to it as best they can. Uh, like Roosh, uh, the detective and the police officer in the book, he just, he's, sort of trying to just survive and every and that's what it is everybody's just trying to survive but there's no hint at the uh at the um at, at, at the you know sort of green of, of people there is there is something where a preacher says to the kid uh something do you know what that stuff is or something but uh there, there's nothing else that's mentioned about that at all so it was it was definitely changed uh for the film uh for the better well it like as i say it's made it more dramatic and uh made it maybe more lasting because uh the book is very slow and many would find it boring on the screen because it just shows a depiction this is very punct uh, punctuated but but i was just sort of thinking like at the end it's like uh uh, the way things are now in politics after the few years that we've had for the past five five years or so uh, in the United States and uh, in the UK here, that it doesn't matter. Like, the, you know, the, the information would get out about uh, sort of greener people and it wouldn't it wouldn't change anything. It would it, the, the government wouldn't change. It would nothing would, would change. Uh, but up until then, you probably think, yeah, that, that would bring down governments that would make things change. Nah, not anymore. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I, like I say, I really, really in, enjoyed, I enjoyed both, uh, because I remember enjoying them before, but I've forgotten how, how, um, different they were. Uh, and, uh, it, it, it like in the book, it, it's always, there's a few issues in the sense like it's supposed to be 1999. So there's, there's really nothing. He puts nothing in there that's sort of new for society or like the guy watches TV, but it's all reflection of what was around in 1966, basically. But over the next, uh, you know, um, 35, 34 years, uh, uh, and it's the same stuff that, that they see. So there was sort of nothing new that was, that was, uh, that was brought, uh, in, um, in, in the film, there's a few things, there's few issues too. It's like, there's supposed to be no paper and stuff like that. It's difficulty, but when they're walking to this, uh, center where people can, uh, you know, uh, be euthanized, uh, like, you know, when they show garbage in most places, it's paper and there's paper floating around on the ground and stuff like that, which, no, that wouldn't be there because of the thing, but yeah, just a little minor things like that. Uh, and uh, it, it's it's a wonderful scene. You can see that there a little bit where um, I think that's Saul, that's uh, uh, Edward G. Robinson uh, walking to, to there. And he's, he's so fabulous. And he was basically almost fully deaf when he did this role. And he knew all his lines and he knew all the cues, where to stop and, and everything like that. I guess the, well, the director Richard Fleischer uh, was was saying that that there was the only problem was when he said cut when somebody else screwed up, he would just continue on with his lines and his cues, and sometimes he would walk off the set because he'd finished and that's what he's supposed to do, but somebody had screwed up so they got to do it again, uh, so that's that's pretty good. Um, as as a uh, commentary, uh, usually they're never they're not that great. A lot of times, um, when they're especially when actors and stuff, and like you know, there's some sort of interesting tidbits. But uh, I just thought it was uh, apropos that it happens. It worked out that it's 2022, and this is my first uh, uh, book to film for 2022. And also, I keep doing this as well. Uh, 
you know, uh, is that there's a Star Trek connection in this as well, where he goes into exchange, uh, the exchange where the library is. The one that's in charge is an older woman. Uh, it's Sielowski, and she uh, she played T'Pau in the original Star Trek series, uh, uh, in the episode of Amok Time. Uh, she was the Vulcan t uh, T'Pau. Um, and uh, she's, a, she's a really good, great actress. Um, and... But yeah, it's uh, it's just another Star Trek connection. So next week, um, next week, well, I can't get it here. Next week will be uh, Night of the Hunter. And uh, I mentioned it in my Friday Reads uh, that I finished reading the book. Uh, it's film that was done by and direct, the only film directed by Charles Lawton. Fabulous, fabulous uh, film. Um, and, uh, I'll be, I'll be doing that next week. So uh, I hope everybody has a good new year and hopefully, uh, things will, will be better. Um, I'm not too sure if it can get any worse, uh, but, uh, we'll see if it gets better. Take care, BookTube.